And that's why I was so interested in your guys' work, because uh, my student is actually working on a game with indigenous tribes, and it's really encouraging. And it's really good to see that somebody already did it and did, did well. It was a good, a really, really nice experience for me to go like, oh, damn, somebody did it, and it was good, and it's been handling like pretty good. So this is Josh Samuels. Um, he's a senior engineer at Raindrop G Games, founder, director, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, not. a lot of things. I'm a janitor too. <laughs> <laughs> Roberto Barrero, which is a consultant at International Indian Treaty Council, and I think president too, director or something? President of the So a real big deal and an honor to have him here. So I'm just going to get out of the way and let them do their thing, and then we'll just have a Q&A at the end. Great. Great. So, thank, thank you. you. Kind of the format will be, I will be doing a lot of talking and, a lot, and allowing and encouraging Roberto to interject all of his awesome wisdom as I, <laughs> as I talk. <laughs> so, um, all right, so you heard who we are, so I'll move on to that. Um, for, for those of you who have not seen or played uh, the game that we're talking about, it's Arrival Village Cacique. It's a strategy simulation based on the Taino people of the Caribbean prior to European settlements. And uh, so the focus of our talk is how, uh, how we built the game and, and how uh, Roberto and I collaborated together, um, Roberto representing the United Confederation of Taino People. Um, one thing worth noting, you'll notice in the screenshots and in the trailer, uh, we started work on this game back in 2009, so the 3D artwork looks outdated compared to what you would see on today's devices, just obviously the painting not, but yeah, 3D. All right, so I'll give you the trailer. Awesome music was uh, produced by Roberto. I really love that song. <laughs> there we go. 
Okay. All right, so uh, I'm going to give you kind of a little bit of history of uh, how this project came about and why you know, it came about the way it did. Um, sorry. So, here, yeah, my bag. So I, I originally I wanted to make a game about um, American natives discovering white people. Um, after researching various tribes, I felt it would be best to portray some of the first people to encounter European settlers in the Americas. Um, also, another motivator for me was uh, a kind of a broad uh, lack of accurate representation, both in popular media, media and in um, school curriculum. Uh, it's like, for example, when I went uh, to school, which was back in the, uh, well, uh, yeah, at that age, I would have been, it would have been early 80s. Um, I know how old I am. Uh, uh, it was, I, yeah, we learned, you know, Columbus discovered America, uh, and then we, and then after that, these uh, these pilgrims showed up, and this, you know, in this other part of the country, and, and so on and so. And you didn't hear, we didn't really hear anything about the aftermath of what happened when the Spanish colonized the Caribbean. Um, the only real negatives that we got were at some point we heard, you know, later on in my schooling, we learned about the Trail of Tears, uh, but that, I think that was. Predominantly, it so it was really glossed over. This massive, uh, you know, change of uh, population. Um, <clears throat> there, a, a worthy side note: there are, is evidence that um, the Vikings actually did make it to what is now in the northern part of Canada, um, but they didn't end up with any permanent settlements. So, I, so the the Spanish were probably the first, you know, uh, permanent settlements in the Americas. Okay, so originally we had a huge idea. Uh, I wanted to make a large RPG adventure game with a, a deep narrative and you know not lots of action, things like that. Uh, I wanted to capture as much as possible the experience of being a Taino villager, um, dealing with the challenge of these new uh, these you know, these new people showing up, who uh, and the game and then and the concept of the game. The idea was that you would be. Um, you would perceive them as new potential trading partners or something. Um, so I, I sought help from different uh, internet groups at the time because um, I didn't have any real personal connections with native groups. So, and this was back in I think 2007, if I remember correctly, maybe 2006. I think it was 2007 or maybe eight. I think seven though. Um, I, I started you know, doing a lot of Googling and kind of reaching out, and I found a couple of kind of generic um, native groups online. I didn't find any specific Taino groups at that point. And I started asking different people uh, for, you know, I, for thoughts and see if anybody could help <coughs> give us feedback on this. Um, and uh, so I, I had to get some responses. A number of people were like, oh, that's cool, you know, great idea. And uh, there was one individual who was concerned about appropriation and, uh, and just how with their usage of the word Taino and things like that, but for the most part, the uh, feedback was encouraging. Um, actually, it's worth mentioning the the word Taino is actually kind of a shorthand. Uh, you can probably speak better than me on this, but um, my understanding is that uh, back in uh, back then, uh, the, the Taino people would refer to themselves based on which island they were on. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong on any of this. <laughs> Yeah, maybe you should say this. I mean, I was going to say like people from Puerto Rico would say they're Borican, for example. I don't know how accurate that is. So, not so accurate. Not so. Yeah, maybe okay. maybe you should we'll tell the accurate go, version. Yeah, we'll go ahead, keep going. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, um, well, yeah. Actually, that was it for that slide. So please, okay. please give the accurate version of that. Well, um, hi everyone. Hello. Well, good. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, should I introduce myself a little bit more? Just uh, I will fill in on that, or um. uh, no? Just uh, basically, um, when we talk about um, racial groups or, or tribes per se today, we, we have a, a sort of baggage that that comes along with that. You know, the, from how we interact with each other, what we learned uh, in the various educational uh, situations that we that we're accustomed to, and uh, back at that time. Uh, when um, at that time it was emerging Europeans, it wasn't even a, a real Europe at, at, at that uh, point in time in, 15, in, the, in the end of the uh, 1400s. Um, there, was, there was a way of, of describing people and people were more in family groups and extended families and so the way people would relate to themselves 
so now today we, we can say that there's Taino or there's um, there's Navajo or Diné or Lakota, wherever. But um, when people were talking to them uh, amongst themselves back then, they might use other terms like uh, in the Lakota language, uh, they'll say maybe the Oyate for the people or, or something like that. And for the Taino also, um, in very early encounters with um, Spaniards and uh, other early explorers, they, w they um, were recorded uh, as a number of times uh, describing themselves as Taino. And uh, basically in the language, it, uh, it breaks down to what we would translate as good people. So meaning uh, that saying that this is who we are. And it, it's when we say good, again, it's even another layer because it's not like a, a Judeo-Christian version. Okay, this is good. This is bad. There's a, there's a North and South Pole. You know, your good people go here. The bad people go here. It's, it's good in the way of, 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 of family relations of responsibility to community, meaning that uh, it was right action, right? Right action in a community, that, that determines if you were good, right, in, in the way we would understand it. So in, in that concept, when the people were saying it's, it's, a, it's a descriptive of who they were, and so today we continue to use that term because it, it was used across islands, in other words, with that language. When you would say Taino, people would understand that and uh, be ready to receive you as as Taino, and so in that in that way, it could also be applied to others who were not even born from your community, but really it was a way to keep the community to get together. And then, as we go to different islands, yes, people would identify the different islands, and depending on what side of that island you you, you lived on, you might call it something different, right? So. Um, so yes, people did identify themselves, geography, like people might say, okay, well, we're the people of the, the Stone Ridge, or, you know, meaning that they have a relationship to that. But in other words, they're, they're, what I'm trying to say is there's multi-layers of identification, and it's not just cut and dry like we see today, okay, this is the Navajo tribe, this is this. And that, that's basically because of set up relationships after col colonization, the way um, treaties were made, et cetera. So, they had to, so that explains a little bit more about that. Thank you. Sorry, I missed that. <laughs> That's why I, I love having Roberto. He he's he great at telling, keeping me accurate. All right. Um, all right. So I did uh, I did do a lot of internet research, and mm -hmm. you can see how well that goes sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, it was worse back then, I would say, uh, when I was doing this uh, again around 2007, I think. Um, there's, I mean, there's the issue of kind of verifying accuracy, uh, uh, and then there's the other issue of a lot of the sources of information would be from either uh, the white colonizers or settlers, so uh, there would be a huge skew to the, the source of information, things like that. Um, and there are other pieces of historical information, such as oral histories and traditions, which generally would not make it out onto the internet, or it's, it's harder to, to convey accurately in you know, simple written form. Um, so, uh, after reaching out to many people, um, a great many of them suggested I speak with Roberto, who uh, uh, the, uh, was described to me as probably one of the best, if not the best, expert on the Taino culture, both past and present. I assume you agree with that, that that's accurate? I don't know if I agree with it. That <laughs> that's, that's what CBS said. You know? <laughs> that's, that's what I was told, and uh, just from our relationship together, um, that's that's been my experience is that Roberto is a massive expert on the subject matter. Um, so, uh, Raul, you introduce more what your background is now. Um, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I, I know. So well, the, that's the all right. Yeah. A little funky. Well, takahi waitiao daka mukaro boriken taino daka koai daka yaha. Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Roberto Barrero. Uh, also, my community, they uh, refer to as Mucaro or Mucaro Aguibana, uh, depending on, on the community situation and, and what we're doing. And uh, basically, I come from the Boriquen Taino community. So my Taino roots come from the island of Puerto Rico, that you know is Puerto Rico today. We call it in the Taino language Boriquen. And uh, my family comes from the southwest of the island, uh, where we have uh, towns like Guayania, Yauco, Ponce. And in that area, um, we still retain uh, a real strong connection in the, the geography, the plants, the towns, and a lot of stories. I, I heard my first native stories from my family members uh, in Wayania. 
uh, when I was just a, just a little boy. And, uh, you know, we never really thought much about it because um, growing up in New York, like many families coming from the island, coming from the Caribbean, you move into urban areas as, uh, as economics de demand. And, uh, you know, for us, we, we understood that as kids, but we never really thought about that. And I think I was in a similar situation to uh, Josh in, in that uh, coming through American uh, educational system, you know, we, we talk about uh, social studies, and then they talk about Columbus, and then the next thing I know, they were talking about the Aztecs, and then it was like the pilgrims, like he said. And when I questioned my, my uh, teachers about that in, in high school, um, one, there was like, oh, well, I thought you guys were all wiped out, was, was the one thing. And then uh, the second thing was, well, you know, we don't really, you know, this is the curriculum that we had. So that, that I mean, that wasn't enough for me. And so I was always um, a little put off at that, and I, I kind of made it uh, from that time in high school uh, until after uh, my own business to really try to figure out why that was and, and why uh, these stories like, well, let me see, if my grandmother is telling me that, you know, we have this native heritage, but yet I'm going to school and they're telling me not, you know, why is that? And as I, as I got older, you know, I understood the impact of colonialism, uh, how uh, educational narratives help shape emerging nations and nationalities, and also about inequality and, and um, discrimination. So these were all part of, uh, of this dialogue that, that I learned about uh, coming from this. So I, I, I made it a point as, as I grew to one, to try to connect with as much as I can to a lot of the elders that, that were in the island who talked about some of these things that were not mainstream. And um, later on, uh, uh, as, I, as I continued uh, along my path, I worked for the American Museum of Natural History for about 11 years in the education department and public programs. I have a, a pretty long history as well in uh, human rights work, uh, human rights advocacy. And so after my time at the American Museum of Natural History, uh, due to my uh, connection with uh, various human rights groups, uh, people working for uh, uh, indigenous people's rights in particular. I started working with uh, friends of mine from the International Indian Treaty Council, which is, was the very first indigenous organization that was accredited at the United Nations in 1977. And this just came out of that whole, uh, you know, we talk about civil rights movements. And also you have to, when you look in that context, native peoples throughout the Americas were also uh, pushing for their rights more heavily around this, the end of the 60s and 70s. And if in the United States in particular, you'll hear about Wounded Knee or Alcatraz. And so the Treaty Council was an organization that, was, that came out of that whole movement. So a lot of the old AIM leaders uh, and, and other leaders, spiritual leaders at that time, they thought, well, you know, we're all being called Indians, right? And Taino actually were the very first ones to be called Indians in, in the hemisphere. We're all being called Indians, whether we're from the top of, uh, uh, of Canada and Alaska, or we're down at the tip of Tierra del Fuego in South America. So we should be coming together, we should have an organization. And th so they formed the International Indian Treaty Council in 1974 in Standing Rock Reservation, South Dakota. And uh, from that time, they've been at the forefront, the organization, of, of really trying to um, mainstream and promote uh, indigenous people's rights, uh, have honor the treaties, etc. So uh, about the time that uh, Josh was talking about, our time that we first started to connect, I was just coming out of uh, a real struggle at the United Nations to adopt what they called, at that time, was the Draft Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And so our organization and myself and United Confederation of Taino People, uh, which is a, a collective of Taino uh, organizations and groups throughout the Caribbean and the diaspora, uh, we were really fighting hard for that declaration in the UN context. And one of the things that, that uh, what, what's so important about that, it talks about you know, culture, self-determination, but also has a concept in there that, uh, that's very important, in, especially in a situation like this called free prior and informed consent. And so when Josh contacted me, uh, and we just got done with this, getting this doc, uh, this document approved. You know, 192 countries, a lot of lobbying, over 30 years of advocacy to get that one declaration through the, the United Nations process. And uh, 
So when I talked uh, with Josh uh, about that, what was what was really good was that I felt like he was really connecting to that to that concept, free prior and informed consent. In other words, you're not going to start a project like this unless you're working with the communities and you really talk it through to see what it is, what they want, and how they want to be portrayed, right? Because maybe we don't have the technical expertise that Josh had in is in building the game, but we're certainly storytellers. Right, and we know about telling a story, and that's something that goes on, you know, that that's been going on for for a long time. So how we trans translate that is how we work together, and, and the result was the game. And Josh will go through more of that. But I just wanted to let you know a little bit more, well, know a little bit more about my background, where I come from, and, and why that was a bit important to me. The way he he had outreach to us. Thanks. Yeah. Um, where was I? <laughs> no, no, you shouldn't should apologize. Are you kidding? Um, um, so, all right, I should have held my place while I was listening. Um, oh, yeah, so, yeah, as Roberta was saying, when I contacted, uh, after a few phone messages, we, we spoke on the phone, and, um, I, yeah, my I was genuinely interested in doing the right thing rather than focusing on, hey, Indians are cool, I and mean, we could give about that for money, right? You know, because that's, <laughs> Not at all. I, I don't even use the word Indian. I just that was meant to be sarcastic. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it, the, the the desire to to do the right thing I think came across. Uh, well, obviously it did, and and we've been working together on on collaborating on these games uh, ever since. Um, I also feel it was really important to work with for a game like this to work with a historian in general. Um, there is the the challenges of finding you know accurate information and having. Uh, context around why certain things were the way they were, and just there will be cultural, uh, yeah, cultural details that just don't come across in other forms of education. Uh, so having somebody who's dedicated a large, I mean, uh, you've dedicated a large portion of your life to Taino history, right, and culture. Yeah. So having uh, somebody who's dedicated a huge portion of their life to this is, is a, makes a huge difference in being able to convey something accurately and respectfully. So that was really, really important for our project. Um, and, and of course, uh, in the case of Roberto, he, he, just a massive depth of knowledge is, uh, it, there were many times where I would ask Roberto a question that I thought would take like 30 seconds, and I'll end up getting like a 20 minute answer. Um, and I mean that in a good way, like, cause just, there's a, you know, I get all of the context and all of the depth around my question that I didn't even realize was there. And, uh, and it helped me learn a lot about what I was doing, which I didn't even realize. So, um, so yeah, it's, it was extremely helpful. And it's one of the many reasons why I tell everyone Roberto is a, t a total history badass. <laughs> okay, so we were, you know, collaborating together and uh, spent a while kind of researching, exploring different ideas. We were doing, at one point, we were doing weekly phone calls for a while. Um, and uh, I was also very lucky because Roberto was acting as our liaison to the community, so he was helping gain uh, the trust there, which is can be also a very difficult task. Um, Roberto also uh, introduced us to a photographer who takes uh, photos of people, you know, obviously now, but dressed and with the, the body paint, um, which is to a decent degree of accuracy, right, for the way life, what life would have been back there. Like the, the, the face, the paint is more stage paint than the materials that would have been used, but the, the clothing and the, and the general designs and stuff are decently accurate, right? Yeah, um, so we had, so that helped tremendously for using, you know, having photographic references and th uh, for, um, for everything, uh, not only people but also structures, uh, you know, the cuts and, and everything. Um, so it it took a while just to kind of explore everything, and uh, but again, there were times, you know, with, as with any creative project, where you feel like you're kind of going in circles. That's why I have the feet walking in circles in the sand. Um, so eventually, we decided to go with something much smaller. Um, uh, this is back in 2009. Uh, a friend was pointing out to me how, you know. The iPhone is the new big thing, and you should make games for that. And I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? Uh, <laughs> so, um, so we, we we decided to go that route. Um, and uh, we, you know, doing mobile, we knew that would make the scope a lot smaller, so that should help us get something done quicker. Uh, the, the original idea of this massive adventure RPG game, well, it would be really cool. Um, it, I, I, we're, I, I, my company is indie. We have no funding. I usually do this on the weekends, so. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that requires a team of a lot of people, which we just didn't have, um, and nor the expertise, you know, to, for that. So, uh, so we just, yeah, we went with something a lot smaller, and um, 
and we wanted to build up, you know, do some ti a few tiny games before building to this final one. Hopefully, making money on them to do that. Um, all right, so I thought let's go with uh, a strategy game, right? Something you know, it shouldn't be too hard to do that uh, and uh, get that done in a decently time, decent amount of time. I don't know if anybody here has has tried to build a strategy game uh, and knows how difficult a strategy game is to build, um, but this answers that. Um, <laughs> strategy games are actually very hard to make. I didn't know that. <laughs> now I know. Um, so it. Yeah, it took a lot longer than we thought it would. Uh, it took about three and a half years uh, mm -hmm. development time. Uh, also, there's the, the challenge of uh, the, the 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 team members constantly coming in and out. Because uh, you know, there's there's no money, so people are like, oh, I got to get busy with my job or whatever. And then you're like, yeah, I understand. <laughs> and there you go. Um, and of course, I've had to make you know, there have been times where I wasn't able to work on it much due to the, uh, just work or you know, stress or whatever. Um, so all of that uh, fun stuff. So, all right. All right. So speaking of team members, this is this is a percentage of the people that worked on the game. This is not everybody. Uh, yeah, there's a couple of programmers, um, and uh, most I think it's mostly artists actually on this slide, and uh, and a writer. So, and that and that was just a fraction of the people. Uh, but as with any, I think with any indie project like this. You end up with, if you have a lot of people come and go, a lot of them do very little or nothing. Um, a few of them do some things, and then a very few do a lot. So that, that happened with this as well. There's a few people that end up doing most of the content. All right, so throughout development, we maintained uh, regular calls with Roberto, and the, the intensity level went down over time, because you know, as we started understanding better what would work or what would be accurate, um, and you know how to convey the proper level of respect. The, the, the need for discussing wasn't as much. Um, so, how well does this game sell? No, there, there you, you can't really tell. The, the high number there is uh, 700 units, and so it you know went down from there. Uh, the the one good thing is uh, I, at two GDCs ago they were talking about. Uh, iOS games that sell over 2,000 units, which we have sold, I think around 2,400 at this point, something like that. Um, that's considered mid-level. Mm -hmm. So we are a mid-level selling game, even mm -hmm. though um, good luck living off of uh, <laughs> around $2,000 over <laughs> so a four-year period or something. So, um, so yeah. But uh, I mean, yeah, from a business perspective, it was a flop. But uh, but there are a lot of flops that are. You know, that don't even sell 100 copies. So from that perspective, I'm happy that we made it to mid-level. All right, so did we learn anything useful? I hope so. Um, so a, a major uh, important thing was um, giving uh, Roberto veto power with pretty much anything. Um, we did this with uh, the artwork, sound, the game mechanics, the narrative, even advertising. Uh, I don't know if you remember this. There was one time where a company wanted to put an ad on our webpage, and you know it wasn't a lot of money, but I was like, hey, we can make some money. And I discussed it with Roberto, and he said, do you have control over the content? And I said, no. And he said, yeah, we probably shouldn't. And I'm like, good point. Okay, done. You know, and that was it. It was just not, you know, it wasn't even done. And it was funny because the guy was trying to sell the ad really hard. I'm like, no, I'm sorry. He's like, oh, come on, I'll do it. And I'm like, no, dude, you know, if we can't control the content, we can't put it up. And he just kept trying to push it. I'm like, no, I don't think you understand. <laughs> um, so this was, uh, yeah, that was very important. I don't know if you have anything to add to that specific aspect of it. The yeah, I, I just think that, um, again, when you're working with any, any kind of community, it, it's important. I mean, from the very beginning, there was a lot of skepticism uh, from folks who were on, on our side who were like, well, you know, what if they, they do this? Or, you know, there's so much abuse out there. And you even see that today. Uh, not too long ago, I, I saw on the internet that there were some folks who made a game where uh, these settlers were going into Australia, mm -hmm. and the part of the game was beating uh, Australian Aboriginal people to death, right? And this was uh, just just circulated around the, in the internet. And these were these were some of the the you know really the the worries that people have. Well, we were, our people have already been through you know so many generations of abuse on so many levels. You know, are we going to allow more abuse? You know, in a game content, are they trivializing our culture? And uh, so, but when uh, we spoke to Josh, and uh, you know, we made it clear that 
okay, we can't be a part of this unless we can say, <laughs> no, we have to hold the brakes on this. This is just too much. There's just certain things that uh, even, uh, you know, when you think about it and think about communities and the way um, relationships are with the world around people, in certain communities, uh, for example, there are ceremonies that only men do and there are certain ceremonies that only women do. And so um, there was another case of that, I believe, uh, I, I forget the company, but but uh, if some of you may be familiar with the, the Maori uh, people of New Zealand, and you know, they have very big on tattooing. But uh, for the Maori, um, when they get what they call, they, they call the tattoos moko. When they get a moko over here, that's a specifically a woman's trait, right? Only the women get a tattoo on the chin right here. So there was a gaming company that, that came out and they made this game and they put the uh, a moko on, on the lead character, but it was a male. So all the Maori were, were freaking out, saying, hey, you know, you're, this is cultural appropriation. First of all, you don't know the stories. Why did you put that on there? It's totally against what we would do. And so, you know, when you hear these type of stories, uh, the communities are, are very, very weary of, of getting involved in something like this. So there really has to be that trust and that, that type of situation, again, it comes back to that free prior informed consent, that, that idea that I was telling you about. And if you ever have a chance, you know, just look at the Declaration of the Rights of, of Indigenous Peoples, because it really uh, shows, it's a kind of a guideline for governments, but for others also, how to engage Indigenous Peoples. So if you ever have a project uh, that you're working on, just, you know, it might be good to just to take a look at the Declaration and see the type of rights people have, because it's not special rights. This is just rights that are part of the human rights system, but that specifically apply to collectives like uh, Indigenous Peoples. So that, that, particular, um, that particular arrangement that we made with Josh was very important, and uh, very important for me because at the end of the day, since I was the, the, the liaison, uh, I would really take a lot of the abuse, right, if something went wrong. And, um, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, nobody really likes to have that on them. So we really had to make sure things were okay and, and, and that, I mean, there was even talk in the beginning, and which is why I think uh, when we were talking about uh, the first level of the game, if, if you read uh, early colonial history, uh, and in particular the colonization of the Caribbean islands, you could read uh, like Las Casas, Bartolomé de Las Casas is one. He has a, a, a book called The Devastation of the Indies and a few other books. These were first-hand accounts of interactions between Spaniards and uh, Taino people at that time and other natives uh, at that time. And I, and I can assure you, uh, it was very brutal. And so when we were talking about that and talking about what we wanted to portray in the games, you know, some of that came up. Well, you know, what about this? and you know, then, then you're talking about subjects that, that can get very uh, intimate to people. Uh, for example, uh, at that time, uh, enslavement of peoples, also the abuse of women, right? Uh, in ways that, you know, we, you know, it's probably not better to revisit in a game or an entertainment area. So these are the type of things and these are the type of sensitivities that we had uh, to, to talk about and to touch upon and finally that this is why we came up with the result for this kind of strategy game where it was more about building community, uh, helping to teach some language, etc. Thanks, yeah. And uh, I should also mention you were talking about taking heat. That's one, one benefit that I gained was if somebody said, ah, this is not accurate, I'm like, take it up with Roberto. <laughs> I just, you know, so it all allows me as a developer not to have to stress out about that. Sorry, everybody. That means that every, you're the point of yeah, hatred yeah. for all sides. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did a good job, so I didn't take that much heat. Uh, you know, yeah. haters are going to be haters no matter <laughs> what, right? But in, in this respect, I, I think uh, most, mostly uh, we, we really received a lot of good reviews from community members, uh, even into different communities who saw this a, as a real positive uh, example of collaboration. Thanks, yeah, it, I, I, I've not had gotten any heat about historical accuracy on this game because of how awesome you are. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm very happy, I'm very proud of that because that's something I, I was very concerned with in making this. All right. So uh, narrative was uh, something that I found to be particularly challenging um, because it's, uh, well, I'm sure it's, uh, all, most, if not all of you, are aware that um, 
if you look at white representation in, in our, and you know, especially in this country, we're pretty much, uh, or in West, yeah, and, and the Western part of the world in general, we're pretty much the normal, right? So we have, and we have a wide amount of representation. White people are are good guys, they're bad guys, they're drug addicts, they're heroes, they're they're just everything, right? Um, especially, yeah, especially when it comes to heroic and all this stuff, it's even more white men, so um, than anything else. So there's just a, a huge amount of, uh, or actually, yeah, I should say straight as well, a uh, huge amount of representation. Um, without, you know, so it doesn't matter if you if you have a stereotype here or there. It's not like, oh, this is how straight white people are. It's like, no, that's just one little variation. Um, but when you're making a, a product about a culture that has uh, zero, a very minimal to zero representation in popular media, you have to be really careful about how you portray the culture because you, your, your product runs the risk of becoming this is how they are. So um, like this is the only way that they are, you know, instead of realizing that there's a lot of variety within humans and groups and everything. Uh, so, all right. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of uh, stereotypes in, in culture in general, even the ones that are considered positive stereotypes, like um, Asians are smart or Native Americans are, are earthy and spiritual, um, you know, things like that, right? It's even if these are quote unquote positive, um, they're still harmful because uh, they turn people into uh, and, and cultures into caricatures rather than real fully fleshed human beings. Uh, obviously, then the, the negative stereotypes are, are harmful for their own reasons, which I don't need to go into. Um, another challenge that we ran into was uh, some cultural misunderstanding, um, you, despite having good intentions. That's why it's also really, really important to have community members uh, to bounce off of what you're doing against. Um, because in our, our case, you know, our intentions were to do the right thing, but there, there was some, I don't remember what it was, but there's some wording on our website that we had. And um, uh, I mean, Roberto, he, he read it and he called it out as, yeah, that comes off, you know, this other way. And I'm like, oh, I didn't realize that. Okay, let's, let's just change it, right? It was just, there are things like that that you're just completely blind to as somebody who doesn't have to live and experience this. You know, I, I, I do have some small amount of native ethnicity, but I mean, come on, I grew up as a white guy, you know, and that's that's been my life experience. So, and all of the privilege that comes along with that. So I haven't had to worry about people mistreating me due to my skin color. It just, it, it's not a thing that happens to me. So, um, so there are just, even though I'm, I try to be keenly aware of it and, or just in general how, what, how we communicate or the actions we take can be perceived by others, there are just things I'm gonna be blind to because I have not lived it. All right. So presenting, preventing cultural misunderstanding is especially uh, essential with the narrative itself um, because it needs to be interesting but respectful and you know treating people as people rather than cardboard cutouts. Um, uh, like here's another example. Uh, while exploring ideas for our next game, um, there was actually one of the suggested ideas was uh, to, to explore uh, bride capture, which is what you were alluding to like a minute ago. And, and, and Roberto shot that down. If you're, if you're wondering, the, one who had, the person who had that dumb idea was me. <laughs> um, but uh, because of the whole issue of you know, we don't want to portray the culture as this, right? There was, there, there are, you know, as with any culture, there are bad things that happened back then, but we need to be very careful how we represent the culture right now because of the, the limited amount of representation there. Um, so instead, we ended up, uh, you know, so that's not some, that's an idea that got tossed out. I mean, the, um, the, uh, um, the story behind the rival village Kasike ended up being much more simple because uh, just to kind of keep it straightforward and uh, and to, to be respectful of representation. Uh, I think something that we could, we, I think we need to look at in the future is um, doing a game that has more of the, more cultural flavor to it than, than we did in our story. Um, so uh, a good example of that, I'm sure many of you have heard of this, Never Alone. Um, they did, a, I, I think they did an excellent job of capturing uh, at least, well, I mean, th this is coming from somebody who knows nothing about Inuit cultures, keep in mind, but from my perception, I felt like they captured a lot of, you know, a, a great way of capturing different aspects of Inuit culture that I would not have known otherwise. I actually, I had the good fortune of meeting uh, some of the developers of Never Alone, including the 
the lead writer, and I really liked how the Inuit community reached out to a game development company to make sure that their stories were, were put in this media. It's kind of, I mean, it's similar to what we did, but it was you know, the opposite end reaching out. Um, and I believe the other, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. A little side note, which I think Roberto will be able to help a lot more say a lot more depth than, than I can. But, and there are a number of words from the Taino language that ended up in, in English. Um, we hurricane is uh, I'll let you pronounce that because that's hurricane. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, you want to just take over for this part because you're you'll you'll do this better than me, anyways. Well, I mean, um, we just thought that it was it would be important and uh, a really. Um, unique way if uh, one <laughs> words were pronounced correctly and um, it, it, it would also uh, help to uh, from our perspective even help to motivate Taino community members because they would hear their words and see the, their words being pronounced correctly and uh, you know this instills a source of pride in the, in the community as well like you know our language is important too and uh, because we're going through uh, language revitalization, uh, uh, this is a, a helpful first step for us as also we explore other, other mediums to help uh, promote the language, whether it's online dictionaries, uh, language app pro uh, programs, etc. So this was a really good exercise for us. And we went through with, with many of the different, uh, you know, the crops, the, uh, the little blurbs, that, the informative blurbs that come up that help you along the way in the game, et cetera. We tried to input some of that language there. Cool, thanks. I, I think it's worth mentioning that the, the word barbecue is also from China yeah. language. And um, hammocks, or uh, that's where we first saw hammocks were actually mm -hmm. um, when the Spanish came over. All right. Um, so um, though we had poor sales, I'm still really pleased with the re reception of the community as we already kind of alluded to earlier. Um, I, uh, I met a cacique a chief, uh, uh, the word cacique, well, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but cacique from a different uh, group other than the United Confederation of Taino people. And he told me he heard of what we did, he saw it, and, uh, and we, he played the game and he said, yeah, I recommend this to my, my people because I think you guys did a good job. So that was, that was the kind of, that was what was key for me was making sure that the the members of the community saw this and felt it was an was an accurate representation rather than you know appropriation or something of that nature. So I was very pleased about that. So from that from that standpoint, I feel like the game was a, a total success, and um, I would much rather take that and not having the money than the other way around. Um, uh, don't worry, I have a day job, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I do need to eat. All right. Um, and in just in general, I feel like the community has been very supportive, uh, and I think a lot of that is owed, of course, to Roberta's hard work. And uh, and we have uh, you know an ongoing partnership for future uh, Taino games as well. All right, so kind of summarizing the essential pieces, um, veto power, as I said, it was this was really really important. Um, uh, reaching out until the right person is found. I, Roberto wasn't the first person who was willing to help, but he was definitely the one with the highest level of expertise and the best connection with the community. Um, distributing historical knowledge. This was a um, this was actually a pretty big challenge uh, for the team. We had uh, you know like Google documents, um, photographs, emails, etc. And uh, no matter how many times or how many things we had, people would still mess things up, and then we had to kind of just repeat it and correct and repeat and correct until they eventually got it. Some artists never quite got there. Others picked up pretty quickly, so it just kind of varied per person. But it was, it was hard to get this information out. We ended up having a person uh, manage the art team for a while, and her hands were extremely full just trying to keep everyone on track and accurate. Oh, that's Susan, by the way. <laughs> um, and uh, community partnership for the narrative itself was also very important. Um, things like learning stories that are passed on orally and cultural nuance, you know, just comprehending all those things are best provided by a community member who is, who is an expert in this. And uh, just in general, I, I cannot uh, stress enough how much, how integral Roberto was to our success. Um, in addition to all of the historical knowledge, all the music that we have in the game was licensed from Roberto, a CD that he produced. So it's not only accurate, but it's, uh, if you, I mean, if you're, if you're here for the trailer, I think it's pretty awesome music too. Mm -hmm. So all of that, uh, all of that benefits. We also, uh, we had late in the game, we, we, we 
slimmed down the story and needed some additional voice acting, so Roberta stepped in and ended up becoming the male voice actor in the game. Uh, so just, it's, yeah, lots of awesomeness everywhere. And that's it. Now we do no. have a minute of time for a Q&A, so somebody, yeah. Hi. Um, so I have a question which I hope isn't too awkward, but I think it's important when we're talking about working with communities. Uh, and that's a question of compensation. Uh, so obviously in terms of revenue, uh, you didn't quite get to where you hoped to. So I don't know if you had like a revenue share agreement in place. But um, did you, Roberto, did you work as a sort of contractor? Did you, did you speak a little bit to the sort of financial arrangement uh, and sort of compensation? Do you, do you want to start? Yeah. OK. Uh, um, so, yeah, as a, I'm pretty upfront with everybody that works with me. Um, since we have no money, we can only share revenue. Uh, and this not only applies to Roberta, but every, you know everybody, right? Uh, artists, programmers, sound designers, all of that. Um, and that was the what we discussed up front. Um, we do have an agreement for a percentage. Uh, we, we, had, we have two. Well, we have a couple of agreements. In the case of kind of the general historical knowledge, that was going directly. To that that percentage is supposed to go. To, I mean, it didn't go anywhere because. The game lost money. I spent more on, than two thousand dollars in marketing, right? So we lost money. But um, uh, so yeah, percentage went to the United Confederation of Taino People, and then we had a separate agreement to license the CD, which I, I paid us, you know, a trivial fee. I think we paid a hundred dollars for it. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, plus a plus also a percentage for that. So there were, there were two kind of percentage agreements that we have in place. It's, um, so obviously they didn't go anywhere because mm -hmm. the money wasn't there. Yeah, I think uh, from my perspective, uh, one, uh, I, I didn't look at this as an individual. Uh, and from the beginning, it was never an individual uh, partnership with Josh. It was the organization, uh, United Confederation of Taino People, and I was the point person uh, within that. So the idea was that if uh, there was revenue coming in, it would go to the organization, and then the organization would be able to distribute it how, you know, wh whatever the needs were. And so that, that was the main thing. For the music, it was a little different because that was, you know, uh, my own uh, enterprise, and so then we made we made a separate agreement for that. But again, uh, at, at the scale that we did, there wasn't really much uh, coming in. But I, I mean, that, that's that's basically if uh, the way I see it. If it's a community exercise, you know, the community needs to benefit, and uh, the way the community was represented in this instance was through the organization. And that's and that's how we, we set up the, the the arrangement between us. I, I would like to add that I, I do hate the fact that I can't pay anybody. It's just even without paying anybody, I already have racked up a decent amount of credit card debt. So it's only so far I can go. <laughs> yeah. You know, I I do have a decent job, but you know, it's uh, that's that's the the kind of challenge. I wouldn't mind external funding. It's just with this kind of thing, you you, you know, you, you, even if you, you there might be some grants here, there, but even those are relatively small amounts of money. Um, to, I'm based out of the, the San Francisco Bay Area, so for me to have a team building this, it's you know it's like uh, probably a couple million a year in salaries is what we would need. Um, anybody else? Well, I have one uh, for you. Uh, you mentioned um, skepticism and abuse from the communities towards like gaming industry. I bumped into that too as well with the Tarumara people. Uh, so I was just wondering how you handled if if and when you had to like present to an actual community, look, this is what's going on and this is what we're going to do and what do you think of that or if you got any like feedback from that? Yeah, uh, for us, um, you know, as Josh said, he kind of put that on me, right? So it was I had to uh, really take, uh, after our phone calls, I would also uh, either get together through conference calls uh, also file sharings and also having actual meetings with people to kind of show them artwork to, to show the levels where we when we got to certain points and then if there was something in the story where I was like oh wait a minute I, I don't really I, I have to think about this a little more that usually meant that I had to kind of like stop take what we're talking about reach out to some elders in the community reach out to some other community leaders and say look this is where we are at this point in the story uh, what do you think about this? And then I would hear the, the various feedback until we, we kind of resolve, okay, well, this is what we can show in this part, or I would do something like this. So that it had to be a, 
kind of like at stages, right? When we were first at this, we had to first present the idea. And what we did was even beyond our community, we, we did a, you know, a pretty mu uh, a massive um, outreach through mailing, not only email, but actually physical mail sent out to some uh, community member, because not everybody is on computer, <laughs> you know, well, at least at that time anyway, and uh, when we first started. And so we said, look, this is the game. How do you feel about that? We did like a little survey, and we said, well, how do you feel? You know, what are some of the things? And we, you know, we sent that out. And uh, as Josh said, pretty much most of the people were pretty positive about about engaging in something like this. Like they thought it was a, the, the idea of an educational tool kept coming up. Like they felt that this would be an educational tool that could not only help the community that, that we're focusing on, but to help other people understand. And uh, if we're clear in the beginning, if you go to the website, that this is what happened at that time, you know, just before European colonization. This is the period that we're talking We're not talking about how the way people look now or what, you know, what the community is going through now, but it was, we're taking stories and we're doing storytelling from the, the, uh, from the wealth uh, of, of the cultural treasures that we had at that time to kind of tell the story. Right. And so people were generally positive about it. We did have a few folks who were like, well, what about this? Uh, you know, ideas uh, about appropriation, again, talking about uh, impacts of violence, and more people were concerned about the portrayal of violence in, in this. Because I guess people uh, feel just inundated with, with so many violent images, uh, and so many things. And as I said from the beginning, if you read the history, there's a lot of violence in that history that is you know multi generational you know that that trauma that that's just passed on and and ref, and, and kind of manifest in different ways right uh, on the community today so that that's what I mean but it was a lot of steps of, of, of consultation to go back and it, it was pretty amazing because as John, there was no budget right and it, at that time we were not very savvy with grants and, and things like that and. Um, so that there was a lot of goodwill and a lot of, even from the organization, we put a lot of our own efforts into outreaching uh, just from our own side uh, because we thought the project was important. Great. Uh, I also have another question. Um, did you need to feel to distinguish, uh, make it very clear that this is the Taino tribe only and not just like the Caribbean as a whole? Because I don't know if you touched base or maybe explore the option of actually using it as an educational tool, maybe mounting on like spaces <coughs> or exhibits or museums, because uh, we were thinking about that maybe naively, because we were not sure what we're getting into, so maybe you can illustrate us uh, about that. Well, we're actually, th this is um, part of the discussions that we're having now, right? In other words, after, after it came out, and we kind of saw the, um, where the gaps were, and really what, what could be done. For, for us, for example, I'll give you a, a, an idea of a big gap. When Josh, uh, we, when we kind of um, distilled the idea, right, brought it down to a smaller scale uh, to this phone app and an iPhone, you know, we were thinking, great, but then uh, not thinking that most of our folks in our own community, you know, uh, mobile apps are big now across, across the world, you know, in Africa, mobile technology taking off all kinds of apps to do everything because people don't have computers like the, the laptops and, and they don't have access to that so even in our own community where the Caribbean has more development than, than some other places people didn't have iPhones mm -hmm. right they, they were on Android and you know afterwards so many community members are like oh we wanted to play the game we want to get our kids involved but we don't have iPhone you know we don't have that so they couldn't actually access it which really affected the sales right uh, r right away. So now um, we've, uh, you, you've talked about that, we're talking yeah. with a uh, university because they saw the game and they actually felt that it was a really good representation and they would like to try to get it into schools, et cetera, to help, you know, when, maybe when uh, this subject comes up, Christopher Columbus, right, always comes up in schools. So now there's, there's another tool that uh, that children will be able to use and say, oh, could, these are the other folks that they're talking about in this story, right? It's not just this blank slate of like, here's Columbus, he has the whole fleshed out, you know, character, and the native people are just like these people looking through the bushes, right, <laughs> in the background, and, and nobody really knows their story. 
right? So this is a way, uh, using this game, we hope that this will flesh out and help balance that. So as people grow and learn and they go through school, they could see that, okay, this was a real exchange of cultures and a lot of that wasn't pretty. But this is who these people were. So that, yeah, now we're talking about, I don't know if you want to add a bit, a bit more. Yeah, um, at the, I think it's the University of Oregon or something, where I did a talk there, and uh, a couple of the PhD candidates there were like, oh, this needs to be an education. I'm like, sure, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, no, we'll do it. I'm like, I like that. <laughs> so um, so they're, 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 they took charge of uh, doing a lot of research, and they're, they're talking about, uh, they're look, researching getting a grant to get the game ported to Android. Um, I mean, truthfully, I'm going to port it either way. It's not, you know, the, the money, again, it's, it's somewhat trivial, so it's not like if I was, if I was actually to pay myself the grant money as, you know, payment for this, um, I would probably be making around one or two dollars an hour, so it's like, yeah, whatever, it's not, you know, I'm not doing it for the money, and I need to make sure the money goes to all of us who are participating, not just me. So, uh, you know, so, so that's just more of this, yeah, cool, some money, but whatever. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, so that's in progress. We have a partner at the university now, and they're, they're basically helping to get that, that going. So hopefully it will turn into something. Uh, I, sh I also want to mention why we ended up on iPhone only. A lot of, we did use Unity, so for those, those of you who are making games, you know that you can easily move from iOS to Unity, whatever, right? That's trivial. But if you do the, the if you hard code too much of the UI, as we did, um, you can't, because <laughs> you have a lot of, so what I'm really doing, the port is really, well, it's a couple of things. One, it's modernizing the code. Um, this was our first Unity game, so there was, you know, part of it, well, for those of you who are software programmers, you know, like, you look at code from six months ago and you're like, what the hell was I thinking? This is crap. <laughs> and you want to redo it. Um, so that's part of it. Um, I, I'm trying not to redo everything, but I probably will, because I'm a software engineer. And um, the other part of it is, well, like I was saying, a lot of it's hard-coded. Uh, just for the iOS screen resolution. So I mean, the guy could easily build the game for Android, and, and it'll work there. But then, like, some of the graphics will be off the edge of the screen or something, depending upon the screen ratio, and um, and just kind of modernizing it, and, and so it's you know, like updating, refreshing some of the graphics and things too. So it's, so there's a lot. It's not just you know, it was it wasn't as trivial as just yeah, just build for Android. It's Unity, right? But yeah, we made some mistakes in developing it, so it's not quite that easy. Right. Um, well, I'm really interested in what you're talking about from uh, several points of view. One of them is the uh, question of temporality and sustainability of these kinds of things, because you're dealing with storytelling that comes from um, generations, and then you have these applications that are transforming, as, as well as the platforms. And so I'm just wondering who has custodianship and who takes stewardship over not just the stories then, but you're then partially having to take some form of stewardship over the the application and making sure the code is updated as every new generation of software changes. So I'm just wondering how you build in an ethos of sustainability around the all the work that's been done with something like this. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that um, these are areas that we're touching on now yeah. uh, because this was such a new uh, venture for us and, and there wasn't really many examples. When we started doing this, mm -hmm. Uh, Never Alone wasn't even <laughs> out yet. Yeah. And uh, we were, for us, it was uncharted territory, and we didn't really see anything that we could really com compare it to in, 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 the right, in the right way but from, from, from our perspective at, at that time. Now that we're entering the new phase, these are part of the discussions that are going on now. We've talked about even um, one of the conversations we had with the university was, um, well, for example, maybe we could make this where the... the they can change things in it. They kind of do their own do like, their version own of the game. Version yeah. of the game and they're like, and they were like well, you know, if we do that, you know, are we going to be changing and have them, you know, actually changing the cultural aspects and then we get into this dark territory again that we <laughs> we didn't really, you know, want to ent venture into. So these, you know, all these discussions are ongoing, but sustainability, that that type of stuff is, is important and it's, it's something that we do have to discuss with really. you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a to date the current plan has been to wing it on my side because <laughs> um, you know it's I have a weekend startup, so and startups are generally known for winging it and mm -hmm. doing it all in the weekends just makes it that much worse. Uh, but yeah, uh, I thought there was something I was going to add and it just it left. Oh, well, it's important. <laughs> it's an important issue. Oh no, I mean it's, it is. Don't get me wrong. I didn't mean to trivialize it. It is definitely important that we keep this going. Um, and I, oh yeah, I was gonna add, like, I would have concerns around other people building stuff with this because uh, 
just you know, people on the internet, they just they will take they will push the limits as far as they can. Uh, and uh, like even with the I don't, I don't know if all of you have played the game, but when you're building up your village in the game, you cannot choose where to place your huts because we had to keep that historically accurate. So you have to build it in like a horseshoe shape. Mm -hmm. You get to pick which side of the horseshoe to build next, but you don't get to choose where they go because we wanted to, you know, this should look like a tiny little village, not what you feel like your tiny little village should look like. Mm -hmm. yeah. How did you visualize combat? I think you showed us maybe like a little bit of it. Yeah, um, for the most part, we avoided it. Uh, the conflict was more about balancing resources and dealing with you know, hurricanes that came up periodically. Uh, in terms of, uh, we had raiders in the game. Yeah, that was what we saw in the trailer. And the raiders were, the game mechanic for that was you have different posts around, well, okay, let me step back a little. So in the middle of the village, you have this, this the kind of a rectangular, different colored dirt there. That was the a ball court. Um, well, it, initially it wasn't. You had to build the ball court, but yeah, eventually it ended up being the ball court, um, which is kind of a major central part of the village. And uh, so we had, uh, so and we had the huts would kind of go around that in a horseshoe shape. And we had these little posts that went around the area of the huts. And when a when a raid was happening, like somebody, you know, you'd get an alarm that a raid was happening, you had to put patrollers on the different posts. Uh, so if you had patrollers, you know, for the posts, you could, like, if you were short on patrollers in a part of the area, you wouldn't have um, been covered. And then um, enemy units would come in, and if you saw the enemy, you'd have to kind of move around to look and make sure see if they're there. If you had a patroller there, you could see them. If you didn't, then they would just walk into the village invisibly and take something and then leave. Um, so if you saw them, you would basically touch them, and then they would they'd say, like, a, an angry, like, ah, or whatever. You know, like, <laughs> we use the word no, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, ooh, that's right. Ooh, so then you're like, Ooh, or whatever, right? You know, because you'd be pissed that you, you caught them. Uh, and that was it. They just disappeared into a cloud of smoke. So it was, it was the combat. It, was, it wasn't really combat. It was very simplistic and very non, a very minimal amount of violence um, in terms of the actual what you were seeing in the game. And then just one more question. Any fantastical like, elements? Any like, myths or just storytelling? Story? Um, for the most part, yeah. we did not do that. And I'm, and I'm a little disappointed that we didn't. Uh, uh, I think uh, I think Never Alone was a good example of um, of how you can incorporate that in a game while being culturally respectful. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, speaking of Never Alone, I am proud that we released our game like about two years before they released theirs. So, so we were still <laughs> first. <laughs> they did they did a great job. You know, they, I, I, part of me is very jealous about the the press they've gotten, but it's all well deserved. So I'm not like angry jealous. I'm just like, oh, <laughs> you deserve it. Um, <laughs> um, sorry, well, I, I got myself off track. The mystical. Oh, the mystical, right. The only thing we really did that was mystical was semis, right? Yeah. I think you should speak more to the semis because you'd be more accurate. Well, it was, um, there's uh, there's icons in the community that were also placed in the konukos or the mounds. If you saw it in the trailer, there's, a, there's even the mound, the raised mound, the farming is part of it. And so, you know, placing the semi or, or, or doing those type of things in there, this, this uh, religious icon or spiritual icon, be part of it. We didn't really uh, focus too much on that one uh, because of the, the, I thought because of the size of the game also and because it was more about the strategy of building the village. Now we're talking about in the next in the next phase uh, if uh, these things go continue to go well with the university and with the grant ma uh, making process that there is an, uh, an opportunity now to kind of explore and incorporate some of those stories in there. Again, because this was the, a first venture for us, uh, really being straight and trying to be uh, respectful in the portrayal, trying to really show uh, uh, about the unity building, you know, aspects of, of, of Caribbean cultural life, which be hurricanes, you know, dealing with that and having those those kind of impacts on, on people were, were more of the, of the main focus in, in there. And so we're hoping that in the next phase that we can get into more of that and being inspired by games like Never Alone and, and seeing what, what can be done, right? And, uh, you know, based on the limitations of, of, of uh, the technical, you know, aspects of it, you know, we'll see what we can do coming up. But that is, it, it, it was something that we both wanted to see, but it just couldn't happen in this, in this realm. I, I should also add that the, the semis were, um, the way they ended up mechanically working was they, uh, you build a semi and then your morale is up by a certain amount. So they, they turned into basically a morale mechanic. Yeah.
Yes, go ahead. So um, I know we already talked a lot about funding and the cost of working, and also um, and how successful the game was monetarily. But I think, and maybe this isn't something that you can answer right now, but it's just like it would be interesting to talk about more as a community. Like, are there ways to make a business model for these types of games that can sustain them? Um, and like you don't have to be in credit card debt or, or have to pay out of your own pocket your developers and your artists. So um, and I don't you know I don't know much about like the different business models that are out there. So like if you know of any games that are already um, that are, have been successful and and can be used as like a case study or like a, a model for sustaining the game. Not that 